human mind is a, a magnificent organ. It's allowed us to walk on the moon, to discover the secrets of life and the physical universe, and to play chess almost as well as a computer. But the mind throws up a major paradox. On the one hand, the human mind is an engineering masterpiece. No robot can see, move, speak and understand, or use common sense nearly as well as a human being. You can't go to an appliance store today and buy a robot that will uh, put away the dishes or run simple errands. And the reason is that the mundane mental activity that we take for granted, such as picking up a plate or understanding simple instructions, turn out to be formidable engineering feats that no human engineer has been able to duplicate in silicon. On the other hand, for all its engineering excellence, the mind has many apparent quirks. For example, why is the thought of eating worms disgusting? They're a perfectly nutritious source of animal protein. Why does the male of our species do insane deeds, such as challenge each other to duels or to murder their ex-wives? Why do people in all cultures believe in ghosts and spirits? Why do fools fall in love? <laughs> well, I propose to answer both of these questions, the, uh, how did the, what accounts for the engineering excellence of the mind and what accounts for its quirks, using three key ideas. The first idea is computation, in particular, that the function of the brain is information processing or computation. I think this is a, a profound idea for a number of reasons. One of them is that it offers a solution to the ancient mind-body problem, namely, how does uh, something as ethereal as a thought or a belief or a desire cause something physical like uh, behavior? In particular, the, let's say you wanted to explain why Bill just got on the bus. To answer that question, you wouldn't have to put his uh, head in a brain scanner. You wouldn't have to run a computer simulation of a neural network. The best way to get an answer would be to ask him. And he'd be likely to say something like, well, I want to visit my grandmother, and I know the bus will take me there. Now, no other theory will have as much predictive power as that common sense one. If Bill hated the sight of his grandmother, or if he knew that the route of the bus had changed, his body would not be on that bus. And that raises the, the puzzle. The beliefs and desires that explain and predict Bill's behavior are colorless, odorless, tasteless little nothings, but nonetheless, they're as potent a cause of physical events as one billiard ball quacking into another. Well, I think the computational theory of mind uh, resolves that paradox by explaining uh, beliefs as a kind of information encoded in patterns of neural activity in the brain, explains uh, desires as goal states, such as those that organize artificial intelligence programs, and explains intelligence in terms of computation, computation being what happens when one pa pattern of information causes another and the relation between the first and the second mirrors some law of logic, statistics, or cause and effect in, in the world. Another reason that the computational theory of mind is so powerful is that it sets a, an agenda for the science of mind, psychology, and the science of brain, neuroscience. For example, in studying uh, how people think, a central question in cognitive psychology has been, what is the form of the data structures that represent information in the, uh, in the brain. For example, if I were to ask you a question like, what shape are a cocker spaniel's ears? Or if the capital letter N was rotated on its side, would it form some other letter of the alphabet? Most people report an experience that's like um, seeing a pattern, these patterns in the mind's eye and which I think can profitably be modeled as a kind of graphic representation in the head, not unlike uh, those used in computer graphic systems. Similarly, in the direct study of the functioning of brain tissue, the computational theory of mind has posed the questions that brain scientists want to answer. An example is the uh, current hot topic in brain science, the search for the neural basis of learning and memory. 
Well, of the thousands of metabolic processes in the brain, how will we know when we found the, the uh, seat of learning and memory? Well, it's when we find a process that satisfies the requirement of being able to store and retrieve information. The computational theory of mind should not be confused with the computer as a metaphor of the mind because it's undeniable that the human brain and the digital computer that you buy in a store are very different in many ways. The uh, computers are serial, doing one thing at a time. Brains are parallel, doing uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of things at once. Computers are fast and reliable. Brains are slow and noisy. Uh, computers uh, display screensavers with flying toasters. Uh, brains do not. <laughs> but the point isn't that the digital computer is literally a metaphor for the uh, brain, rather that the explanation for how the hunk of matter that we call a computer and how the hunk of matter that we call the brain can accomplish intelligence have a fundamental principle in common, namely information processing. An analogy would be that we invoke the same laws of aerodynamics to explain what keeps airplanes in the air and what keeps birds on the, in the air, but that doesn't commit us to a, an airplane metaphor for the bird and cause us to look to see whether birds have jet engines and uh, complementary beverage service and headphone jacks and so on. A final comment on the computational theory of mind is that it's by no means an obvious or uh, banal observation. In fact, I think it runs counter to the dominant way of thinking about uh, the human mind in uh, our culture and in everyday speech. You're apt to hear the following kind of explanation of behavior in ordinary conversation. If only Fred had an outlet so he could let off steam, vent his hostility, and channel his rage rather than bottling it up, he wouldn't have exploded last Tuesday and shot up the post office. Now, this is a, an example of the hydraulic model of the mind. The idea that thinking is powered by an overheated source of fluid or pressure that has to be properly diverted through channels or else it will leak out. We um, know that the brain doesn't literally work by uh, the flow of energy or pressure, but rather by the flow of information. And that leads to an interesting scientific question. Since it's undeniable that people act as if they explode or they need to let off steam, but we know that the brain doesn't literally work that way, it forces us to ask the question, why is the brain going to so much trouble to simulate energy or pressure, given that it doesn't literally work that way? And that's a question that I'll return to at the end of the talk. The second idea after computation is evolution. All over the living world, we are impressed by signs of uh, complex design in the living world. Uh, the organs of animals and the parts of plants have improbable organization that brings about some unusual outcome. For the classic example being the eye, which has a lens and retina and iris and uh, many unusual kinds of tissue, all precisely arranged to form an image on the uh, light-sensitive surface at the back. It's impossible to make sense of the eye to come up with a coherent des description of it without talking about it as a system that, in some sense, appears to be designed for clear image formation. This makes uh, much of physiology and anatomy a kind of reverse engineering, where if forward engineering consists of uh, coming up with a goal and building a machine that carries it out, reverse engineering consists of finding a complex object and trying to infer the goal that it was designed to carry out. Now, of course, unless um, you are a creationist, you don't literally believe that there was a, an intelligent engineer that designed the eye with some foresight or goal in mind, but instead you appeal to Darwin's theory of natural selection, which as uh, Richard Dawkins has uh, eloquently explained in The Blind Watchmaker is the only physical process that we know of that's capable of generating the appearance or signs of engineering in the natural world. Now, the human mind is a uh, complex device showing signs of sophisticated engineering. A simple proof of that is the fact that 
uh, despite decades of effort, human engineers have been unable to duplicate what the mind does in robots and computers. And that suggests that psychology ought to be a form of reverse engineering, of figuring out what purpose, in the special biological sense of purpose, the human brain uh, evolved to fulfill. And since the kind of design that we see in the mind uh, is not the work of an engineer with foresight, but rather a consequence of natural selection, it suggests that the answer to the ultimate answer to the question, what is the function of the mind, is survival and reproduction in the environment in which the mind evolved. And that would be the uh, hunter-gatherer or foraging lifestyle in which we spent 99% of our evolutionary history until the very recent invention of agriculture in a small number of areas in the world just over 10,000 years ago.